This week we made 23 of the 226 recipes in Start Here by Sola L. Whaley. Six mains, 10 sides, six desserts, and one dependency. Average time per finished dish was an hour and a half with each recipe typically serving four. And the average cost per serving was $5.78. Sola self-describes as your friendly neighborhood food person. And many of us first met her during our time at the BA Test Kitchen. But today you could just as easily recognize Sola from TikTok or the New York Times or the History Channel or Babish Culinary Universe or as a judge on The Big Brunch. If there's food, you can probably find Sola nearby. She kicks off this book by calling out that she always struggled to learn the way she was expected to. She could memorize the details, of course, but the actual lessons never quite clicked unless there was a little bit of context. So she wrote Start Here for people like her, packing in context wherever she could to help those details stick around. That being said, Sola does not intend for Start Here to be an all-encompassing book about cooking anything and everything. Instead, she focuses on just a few fundamental techniques to get you up and running. That way you can start to explore on your own and most importantly, get dinner on the table. Our goal for a Cult Flav cookbook review is to cook at least 10% of the recipes in a week. This book has more than twice the recipes of a standard cookbook, so Sola made us work for it. I'm so tired. <laughs> but at least the planning was a little bit easier thanks to the menu she tucked in the back of the book. That also meant that we were usually making today's meal on top of prepping for dinner for the next couple of days. Like I think I touched on five different recipes just today, but in like varying degrees of completion. That's almost certainly not how Sola intended for her menus to be used. So I don't think she intended for us to make all the menus in a row, but it's very funny. Yeah. <laughs> This is not the intention, but we're gonna fucking do it for this review. And while we were ultimately successful, it was a real all hands on deck situation. Enjoy day one. Day one cooking out of start here. We're gonna kick off this week with her comfort food you can cry into menu. That includes her cheesy macaroni pomodoro, Waldorf salad with buttermilk, honey mustard dressing, and chocolate pudding pie for grownups. Are we gonna call out that pie's on page 420? Technically 421, but the photo's on 420, and that seems intentional. Let's do this. I love that we're starting with a celery heavy salad. Listen, I'm just a sleepy boy. Off, buddy. Not the prettiest celery I've ever seen, but it'll work. Yes, this fridge. Look how completely full it is. Here's your nuts. How to make cheesy macaroni pomodoro. Coarsely crumbled blue cheese. It's probably a little bit much, but it should be fine. I'm gonna leave this assembly for later because no one wants a soggy salad, right? Parmesan. Please oh, get she's down. Like coarsely ground, but it looks like she got really fine. Oh, fuck it. I'm just gonna do coarsely grated. Why is there only like. She uh, said one cup. For oh, two people? Yeah, one cup of noodles for two people. That's crazy. Serves one or two. You want That's it, one I, serving. You want In her description, it says, it feeds one if you're feeling like you need extra food. So I was like, oh, okay. Let's just make more. We're not driving. Is the butter for mounting the sauce? Yep. There is quite a bit of extra sauce, so it should be fine to add extra. You melt the Parmesan in? Oh, right, it's cheesy yep. Pomodoro. Three quarters of a cup? Yep, 85 grams, baby. Oh, she says 85 grams, I see. I was like, that's definitely more than a cup. Cut the heat, melt the butter, monte au beurre, au beurre, monte au beurre. Strong start with the celery salad, here we go. This is the first time we've done one of these since we got the dog. Yeah. So we, while one of us was cooking and like focused on a thing, the other one had to kind of like. The other one was manning the fryer. Manning the fryer, yeah. Buddy, do you gotta go outside? I can help you. Let's talk about this. Mm. We went with a Toma blue cheese here, which is very mild. Yep. This is more bitter than I'm expecting it to be. I like the pops of the grape and the apple in it. I think they really help. Did you season it at the end? Balance. With salt? Yeah, it called for salt and pepper at the end to taste. Oh, no, I didn't. That will probably take the edge off that bitterness. Would you like me to? Sure, you can season me. Dust you? Okay, that's good. No, I don't need more. I'm salting to my taste. 
Mm. That's better. Instantly. Mm -hmm. It's like when um, a signal on TV is staticky, mm. and then you like tune it to the right location. Now it pops. It's like less muddled. Extremely crunchy salad. Mm -hmm. I love a good crunchy salad. This is Great all dashers. the crunchies. How did it pair with the pasta? Here, this is oh. a single serving bowl. <laughs> I don't want that much, I just wanna try it. This is like very similar to a mashup between classic red pasta and tomato soup, which is the intention with this dish. Red pasta, do you mean like red sauce? Red sauce pasta. For it a is a very basic sauce. Like you fry the garlic very slightly and then tomato in, you're ready for pasta. Mm -hmm. This isn't the easy pasta I would make for myself, but I get it. Hint of garlic, decent salt, I wouldn't call this cheesy. There is cheese, but like it's not cheesy, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Like this might be a case where it's easier to follow her photo direction than it is to follow mm. her written direction. But yeah, I think we got a little bit more of like a gritty texture for ours. All the parm is stuck to the bottom of the pan. I would say skip the parm. And just, skip the parm. Yeah, just grate it like mm. really finely at the mm. table. And you'll have a nicer time, I think. On top, yeah. I'm excited to try this yeah. pud pudding pie. The pudding pie. Dressed with whipped cream, olive oil, and salt. That's pudding. I'm glad I didn't add sugar to the That's whipped cream. That's 100% pudding. It tastes like the um, ganache layer in a uh, Dairy Queen cake. Mm. The, the salt is it for me. The salt is nice. It's still so sweet, like. That is a heavy, heavy, heavy dessert. I wanna try more of the crust on its own. It's just Oreos, right? Just Oreos and butter. Having never made pudding from scratch before, I'm very pleased. Mm -hmm. In terms of execution, mm -hmm. I think this is a smash. As a beginner who's never made pudding from start to finish before, this is pretty good. I thought it was pretty easy to follow. If you've made a roux, you can do this. So if you're making something to cry into from this menu, what is it? I think the only thing that I would cry into is this pudding pie. I feel like I'm, I'd go Waldorf. You'd cry into the Waldorf? I mean, it's the only thing from this I want to make again. I think mm. I might just make the pudding part of it again, honestly. What would you do with it? Eat it. Really? Yeah, just eat it like a snack pack. All right. <laughs> Hello, my name is Sarah and I am not a confident fish cook. It's always made me a little bit uncomfortable. It might be the sliminess, it might be the eyes. I don't really know. But either way, I try to cook at least one fish recipe, if I can, in a book to help me improve. And this week, Sola's for steamy summer nights menu was my opportunity to brush up on some of those skills. Look at me touching fish. And while I was successful broiling salmon, I did also set off our smoke alarm in the process. Here's day two. The day two cooking out of start here. Today we're making her for steamy summer nights menu, which consists of watermelon chot with lime, ginger, and cashew clumps, chilled green tahini soba, crispy skin salmon with radishes and nook chum, nook chum, and honey vanilla semifredo. Most of the work we did yesterday. I'm gonna start with the salmon, you're gonna start with the chot. Yep. Position a rack in the center of the oven and preheat to 425. Do you know where the radishes are? Uh, toss with one tablespoon of oil. What kind of oil? Neutral oil. On the one half of the sheet. Nook chan. How's it smell? I didn't check it. It smells a little fishy, but not bad. Can you grab me some paper towels? My hands are salmon-y. Oh, fuck. Could you also grab me some oil? Uh, okay, can you help me with the um, salt part too? Cause I, need to salt. <laughs> I don't need you for this part. Can you do this other thing? Actually, for me? I do need you for this part. Yep, there you go. Set the salmon on the prepared sheet alongside the radishes. So I'm assuming that the skin side is up if you're looking for the skin to get puffy. I think it's gotta be. Turn it. Okay, great. Can you pull up my sleeve? I feel like I'm just like, Bryn. <laughs> Help me. That's every time we're in the kitchen. It's just gonna be 12 to 15 minutes. Two to four Thai green chilies or serrano chilies. Did you want Thai or serranos for this? Serranos. It's gonna be a very high ratio of chili to other stuff. 
you have any clean cilantro already? Yeah. I have to say, this looks fantastic. I'm so worried that this is gonna catch on fire. It's in six to eight minutes? Six to eight minutes, yeah. Wow. Definitely smelling a lot of charred burn bits. Fry, get out of here, buddy. Save yourself. You're gonna hear the sounds of Fry and his favorite toy, which he is currently Demolish. dissecting. Do you wanna start with the semifredo so we can knock that thing out? Yeah, let's do that because it's melting. Very sweet, very honey. Extremely sweet, extremely honey, but I like the texture. Texture's nice, especially for not needing a an ice cream maker. Yeah. Um, I think the aeration that I was doing at the end, I could have gone a little bit longer and we would have ended up with an even airier texture, mm. which would have been nice. I fucked up. I went slightly, like 30 seconds too long on the whipped cream, and so it's a little too stiff. And so since the uh, egg mixture is really liquidy, you get like clumps of whipped cream throughout it, which are gonna end up being really uh -huh. light, and then the rest is gonna be too dense. I'm gonna try and call an audible and save it by whipping them together to bring back that lightness and also get them homogenous. Okay. And we'll see how it goes. Um, I think that I think trick good, worked though. great though. Yeah, I'm really happy with this. Where Aside from we... the sweetness. The sweetness I think could be taken a little bit down, but. Mm -hmm. It is honey flavored, so. Right, but if you like sweet things, I think this is great. Honestly, what I kind of want with this is like some roasted mm. cumin. Mm. Like it's like, you can see how that would fit with it. Right. The salmon right. is probably already not as crispy. Looks fairly well cooked. A little overcooked. Like, it slightly like, over. Yeah. I feel like the sauce is really gonna deliver. I don't even wanna try it without the sauce. I've never had a cooked radish before. It's kinda good. It like removes some of that bitterness that comes mm. with the sharpness. I like the sharpness of a radish, but it often comes with kind of like a watery bitterness mm. that I don't love. I think this is actually pretty great, and it, especially with the nookchan, mm -hmm. which really helps liven it up. Um, it's overcooked in the way that like, slightly overcooked chicken has that like sticky feeling right. in your teeth. The nookchan is key. Yeah. Gives you garlicky, chili, limey, fish saucy. I think my only notes for this are if I did it again, I would cook just the salmon mm. on a separate tray mm -hmm. than the um, greens. The um, nak chum saves the day mm -hmm. for this whole thing. If this didn't have it, it would be so mild as to essentially be unflavored. Mm -hmm. There's nothing going on with the salmon other than salt. It would salt. just be salt. Yeah. There's mm. salt and oil. The downside of this menu is that all these things are gonna like break apart so fast. Okay, oh. let's do the soba. The first thing I'm getting is like a bitter herbaceousness. Yeah, and then a little bit of sharpness from the onion. Yeah, I'm getting like a lot of citrus too. Whoo! Salty sour. I think it's salt. Mm. I think that's mm -hmm. all it is. This one isn't quite hitting it for me. It just seems like everything- It's too layered almost. Yeah, everything is its own burst of flavor and it doesn't feel like it's quite together. It's like sequential. Mm -hmm. Like you get bitter, sharp from the onions, mm -hmm. and then lemon. I mean, it like rotates back through. It's yeah. surprising, honestly, how it works. It's not terrible, but I wouldn't make it again. No. Are you to try this watermelon? Yes. So far, I'm getting watermelon. Mm -hmm. Extra burst of sweetness with the crumble. A little bit of spice with the serranos. It's nice. It's like a very, very summery watermelon salad. I'm gonna try it seasoning this. Because I'm losing a lot of detail here. Like the ginger disappears. Mm. The lime disappears. The... Clumps are only giving me sweetness and not any of the right. spices. Like I really want the cumin out of those. There's cumin in there. There's not coriander in there. I think this is a really high potential dish. The execution isn't quite hitting for me, but I love the idea. Smash on the salmon, smash on the semifredo, pass on the soba. Uh, I'm intrigued by the watermelon. I think a light smash for me because I like all of the ideas going yeah. into this. Cumin and watermelon? Fox, dude. Last year I spent a month and a half working on a focaccia pizza recipe that we affectionately called Mozzarella Fitzgerald. Since then, there's nothing I love more than making somebody else's focaccia pizza recipe just to get their take. And luckily, that's the core of Sola's movie night menu. I was admittedly less stoked to make toffee popcorn. That sucked. But I'm really glad I did it. Roll day three. It's day three cooking out of start here. Today we're making the to eat on the couch while watching a movie menu. Are we gonna move our taste testing setup? I don't think so. That includes a house salad, classic red sauce pizza, and almond toffee popcorn. 
a lot of this prep work we already did. So we're going to roll that footage and we'll catch up to you when it's time to move on. This is a really smooth transition. Yeah. Hit it. <laughs> You're definitely smoking. I'm, I'm yeah. worried. Scented continuously shake. Babe, you can't uncover it completely. <laughs> I thought you were gonna go for a little sneaky peeky and you were like, oh shit. I think we're done. One teaspoon. Off, right off, off. I'm gonna call it. This smells like it's gonna burn any second, so quickly and thoroughly. Oh shit, it's solidifying. Ah, uh, this sucks. <laughs> this is gonna be a fucking disaster. I'm never doing this again. This is awful. That sucked. I feel like I'm doing the flaky salt a little bit late, but it's done. Good. The toppy popcorn. Three fourths teaspoon. Can we just do one teaspoon? So we're just kind of, what, working the dough slightly? Gosh. Welcome back. <laughs> we gotta do the pizza. Can you spread? No, I'm gonna do, I'll just yeah, do it. Yeah, I'm gonna prep the ingredients. This is a lot of olive oil, but we're gonna do it. For our New York ass cookbook, we got New York ass sauce from Carbone. What herbs should we use for this salad? I got dill, parsley, cilantro, and basil for it. Pick one. Ground sumac, toasted and cracked black peppercorns, toasted and cracked coriander, or dried oregano. Parsley. I would pick oregano for the context this. we're using it in. Does that sound okay to you? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just gonna tear these up, I think. We lost a couple good soldiers to the sink. My dough definitely shrunk. Right off. Where do you want to start tonight? Well, we started here. Yeah, uh, after I talked a lot of shit about toffee, it's pretty good. It felt bad making it. It's not that bad. That is annoyingly pretty good. The only reason that this was hard for me to make was because we're testing thermometers. Yes. So I was testing a thermometer with the toffee. The thermometer that I was testing made it really hard for me to read what the temperature was because it kept jumping all over the place. Mm -hmm. And so I got nervous because I thought I was overcooking it. Ah, uh, this sucks. But I think it turned out really nice. It's like salt, it's salty, it's sweet. It's, it's not chewy, but like, I don't It's know. crunchy. Yeah. It's like glassy. Yeah. Which is like perfection. Mm -hmm. That's what you want. But I like the almond slivers in it. I think that adds a nice little different type of crunch, yeah. It's not super sweet. Like it's definitely sweet. It's not like overly sugary. I mean, it's a good amount of salt to balance it out. Mm -hmm. Love the like little coconut hint there There's from no cooking it in the coconut oil. Oh, we cooked the popcorn in coconut oil, right. Holy shit, I forgot we made the popcorn from scratch too. Yeah, okay. Wait, but you can't uncover it completely. <laughs> this was two days ago, so. Um, okay. I want a piece with kind of everything on it, so I think I'm gonna go with this one, because it's an edge, and I like a good edge piece. Mm. I think the effectiveness is really determined by the sauce. And yeah. I don't think marinara makes for a very good pizza sauce, personally. Yeah. It's not bad. Yeah, I think the biggest thing for me is just like the dough is under seasoned and I think that the mm. sauce isn't strong enough. Like it's just a very mild pizza. Like there's mm. very little flavor here other than like a little bit of olive oil maybe. Yeah, a little bit of olive oil. A lot of olive oil. No, a little bit of olive oil flavor. Oh, flavor. It's a very like a uh, relatively tight foam for mm -hmm. focaccia. It's not hitting for me. Of the focaccia, I get a lot of yeast. I get a lot of yeast flavor in the I focaccia. I get no yeast. None of it? I get flour. I get, I get so much of the yeast. That's like all I taste. I think the texture is exactly that of a kitchen sponge. Holy shit, you're right. 
It's not like offensive by any means. I, I just don't. If I was ever making pizza again, it would not be this. Should we try this? Let's do the salad. salad. Do you want some more salt? No, god damn it. I already salted it to my taste. Yeah, it's a house salad. She gives you a list of lettuces. She gives you a list of herbs. She says, choose any within this category. Mm -hmm. Throw some olive oil, some lemon juice, some salt, mm -hmm. and an egg dried spice. She gives you a lot of options. Yep. And that is nice. If you're learning how to build just a really simple salad, throw some herbs in it. Get some salt in there. Smash on the salad, smash on the top of the popcorn, pass on the pizza. It's so hard to stop eating. Before we get into Sola's comfy winter night menu and the braised short rib main, I think it's important to say that we have a beef with beef. Our shared unpopular opinion is that even the best cuts are a little bit underwhelming too. It's Dua Lipa. Is... Go girl, give us nothing. <laughs> Especially in a steak or roast form. On the other hand, we did get to eat a whole pavlova, so win some, lose some. Play day four. It's day four cooking out of start here. Today we're making her cozy winter nights menu. Braised short ribs with anchovy and so much garlic. Steamed vegetables such as baby potatoes, carrots, and Swiss chard. We're Notably not a recipe. All three, not really a recipe, but she has guidelines for it. So we're gonna call it a recipe. And vanilla pavlova with cocoa and citrus. Do you want something to drink? Do you want to see the prep for this? Probably. Yes, I do want a drink. Okay, I'll go get us a drink. All right, let's get cooking. Big old short ribs. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Why are you whisking it with a fork? Because it says to moisten it, stir to moisten the cocoa, and then whip it. Dry cocoa is so hydrophobic though. Little soft still. Soft peaks. We might have over whipped it. Okay, here we go. 40 garlic cloves. My fingers are starting to stick together. Off. Hi, buddy. Can you get off, please? got some step-by-step -step instructions here that's gonna help me greatly. This okay. isn't even for today. We're cooking all the beef. We're way cooking ahead of time? all the beef. We reheat it the next day. I mean I suppose that's easy. Short ribs are in. Whew. That's fun. I didn't realize that I didn't have a microphone on. Not quite there yet. I think we're there. Two spatulas for this. Shape it into a thick disc. Bake until the outside feels crisp. It's probably gonna be an hour. Okay, cut the citrus. She gives you a little guide on how to supreme. Look at you, babe, Supremes. Hmm? I called it Supremes on camera. And she says, arrange any quick cooking green in your steamer, cook until bright green and crispy and tender, transfer to a plate. That's it. I would never survive Great British Bake Off if I had to make a pavlova. He'd use his eye lasers to kill you. It tastes good. This is our art piece. Oh. This is Sarah Jackson Pollock. We had a battery die, folks. Like right as we were finishing, the battery died. I think the biggest thing that you missed was our roast on roasts. Just the idea of roasts, because if you stop to think about one, yeah. for even a second, it doesn't hold up. On the plus side for the short ribs, they do fall apart. I could cut this with my fork. I'll, I'll show you. Sarah, let's put this in front of the camera for the people. Yep, here we get go. Get it, Cutting go demo. to town. Yep, get them. Oh, roast them, babe. Oh my Get them. God, it Sm cuts. No, just smush it. Don't even use the edge. <laughs> Come on, baby. Look you got it. this. Look at it go. You just cut the fat off. At the end of the day, it's just beef flavor 
and carrot. And the the garlic doesn't come through. Forty garlic cloves. The lemon doesn't come through. Okay. It just overpowers all of it, and it's just for boring beef flavor. Yeah. Even well salted, we're getting nothing. And it's an expensive cut of meat too. Big old short ribs. It's Dua Lipa. Is... Go girl, give us nothing. <laughs> that's not a solo problem. That's a roast in general problem. Yeah. That's a steaks in general problem. Right. If you just want the flavor of beef, go off. But like, give that idea a little scrutiny. Just saying, like, because it's beef, you shouldn't season it or like do anything because you just want to taste beef. Well, it's there are fine. Forty garlic cloves, and I was assuming like. Fucking no garlic noticeable. Yeah. The whole bottle of wine, gone. We put in beef stock, it's just beef, a little salt, carrots. Carrots. I think beef really excels on texture, but you could apply it to more interesting things. And you could do a much less expensive cut than this and get probably a very similar right. outcome to this. You could do it in this easier method. This is so method. expensive. Ugh. Boring. Um, Rant over. That said. We ate a lot of this. It's still good. It just, it only tastes like meat and carrot, like beef and carrots. It reminds me of going to grandma's house after church on a Sunday. I'll you're say. taking a high price cut and you're turning it into chuck roast. Right. Okay. Pavlova. Here, let me get the meat off of my fork. It tastes amazing. It's like angel food cake meets yes. milk bread inside. Yes. It has almost a like cotton candy like ability to dissolve in your mouth. Yep. The cocoa whipped cream is incredible. The mm -hmm. blood oranges add so much acid and like cut through everything. Yep. It's fantastic. It's so good. Now I want to make more of this. I'm not beating myself up about failing about this because one, it tastes amazing still. And two, I think I know where I fucked up and how to change it for next time. Smash on the pavlova, we'll be making again. Light smash. The worst outcome you can get is a roast, and that is not terrible. Right. It can't ever reach exciting, I don't think. Good. Like going from that to this, I think maybe gave it like. <laughs> you know you what I mean? You needed something that was more interesting to combat Ooh. the <laughs> boring, the boring roast. They stand so far apart from each other. They really do. They really do. Yeah. We sure. might eat this entire pavlova tonight. I'm very tempted. <laughs> It's so good. It's really good. Our fifth meal titled Ham's Favorite Meal was our first advanced menu. And it had us making everything from pickles to bread to sauces to teddy and a dessert that we'd never heard of but stole our hearts. Fuck, oh my God. I give you day five. It's day five cooking out of start here. Today we're making Ham's Favorite Meal menu. Broiled lamb kofta and all the fixins, dill pickle cucumber salad, gelée's classic saffron stained taddy, perfectly puffy pitas, and fruit on the bottom coconut mahalabia. All right, let's get cooking. Okay, we made all this stuff a couple days before, so here is that footage. She recommends bitter orange marmalade, and that's what we're gonna use. Good. Pour this in. Some of these will just go in the fridge. I think you could use a little more sherry vinegar. Mm. Tasty. My eyes hurt so much. Onion juice. Do not toss. There we go. No discernible meat fibers. 
You got it, Sola. Now we're gonna mix the pita. And rest for 15 minutes. Need the mixture in the bowl until it comes together into a dough. It's gonna be sticky. super sticky, but do not flour it. 40 minutes. Fry it off. Two tablespoons. And a half. And a clean nonstick. We have to make a mound now, but not let it touch the sides. There we go. There's my mound. That looks pretty good. I'm assuming that this can kind of just go wherever. Ham saffron tea. Let's flip back to our pita. Do not use flour. There's one more proof on this pita before it's good. A quarter inch thick. Let's check for doneness. The rice is well cooked. It's got stuck. Shit, I think I fucked it up. I probably should have gone with um, parchment paper. And proof for 30 minutes. To roll each portion into one inch thick log, then flatten. I wish she had a weight for this. Like, fine, I can eyeball it. Flatten it. My onion juice from yesterday. So we cook the pita first. Barely blonde along the edges. Barely blonde. I mean, we got a really nice poof. Till crusty and deeply brown. Oh, it's so hot. Oh, it's in my face. Ugh. Your face is all red now? Yeah. I'm not proud of this. Ah. There's bits that are like perfectly crispy mm -hmm. and like brown. Mm -hmm. Fucking hits. Kind of the burnt s'more thing, right? Like yeah. it doesn't really matter that much. Right. I just think it would be better if it were all like A little bit browned. less. A little bit less mm, charred. Yeah. We'll just call it blackened rice, like blackened chicken. I think some of the cues make sense if you know what toasted rice smells like. But in my mind, I was like, I am not sure if I'm smelling toasted rice at this point, or at this point, or at this point. You didn't have a clear picture of what you were aiming for? Right. I think if I did it the same way that she describes it one or two more times, mm -hmm. I would nail it. All this to say, even if you try this and you have an outcome like mine, it still tastes good. It's still really good. It could use a little bit of salty thing, but it's good, nice. And also, I totally thought that the entire bottom was going to stick to my pan because I did not technically use a non-stick pot for this. Didn't technically in that it wasn't remotely. But I was able to scrape off the majority of the bottom of this. And that makes me feel pretty good. This is great. So, okay, let's talk about the flavors right in here. A lot of nuttiness from the roast, mm -hmm. like the, the really toasted rice. Um, not much saffron in general. The barberries cut through everything mm -hmm. so well on board. Like, this is one of the better techniques I've ever had. Kismet couldn't touch this. Kismet could never. Okay, these are the only two pitas that actually puffed. They're so fluffy. 
the They're ones that did. Extremely fluffy. Very light. They're not at all the like kind of shoe leather pita that you often see in a grocery mm. store. I have to try it with a little bit of everything. A tomato sauce, mm -hmm. um, tahini sauce, and sumac pickled onions all go with this. What is the tomato sauce? Uh, it's like grated tomato, garlic, olive oil, and I think that's it. Nice. It's great. Salt. The actual kofta is a little dry, mm -hmm. but I think if you have these two things and this, it's it just works. broiling relatively thin meat. It's just kind of par for the course. If you yeah. get a good crust, you're not going to get a good inside. Not the best kofta I've ever had. But that um, tomato sauce is really the good. The tomato sauce is the star for me. Just want a pile of sumac onions mm -hmm. and tomato sauce. And the rice can soak up everything that you drop. I think the main thing I want is like a bunch of herbs. Okay. Mahalabia. Yeah. Never made this before. Is that straight marmalade underneath? Yep. Straight marmalade on the bottom. And so what are the, what's the middle component? It's like a coconut custard. It's delicious. I love it. It has been so much. out at room temperature for a minute. So. Doesn't matter. Fuck. Oh my God. Yeah, that's shifty. It's coconutty. Deeply it's coconutty. Sweet, but it's not too sweet. There's like a, a bitterness to it. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's nice. It's welcome. I feel like it's, it's the, welcome the pith of the orange. Coconut chips as a topping is also great. Yeah. The texture is so nice. You need a little bit of crunch. Mm -hmm. Strong week for desserts. Pita smash. Pita smash, yep. I have some reservations around the technique because I think it might not be the most beginner friendly. So that's like the open question to me. Is like from a beginner book standpoint, I is see. that the best way to do it? Pass on the kofta. Mm -hmm. It's just a little bit too like... It's just meat. It's meat flavor again. But smash on all of the sides for it. Light smash on the tahini sauce for me, but the rest. Yeah. I think it's like if you're learning how to make a tahini sauce, that's a great way to start. Same goes with the sumac onions and the tomato. Uh, the mahalabia. Smash on the dessert. Yeah. We have one more day and then we're done. I'm just gonna keep eating this. I don't know if you caught it, but I completely forgot to serve the cucumber salad yesterday, but you didn't miss much. I don't think it would have made the kofta better, but I do think it would have made the overall like sandwich yeah. better. For our final day, we decided to go with a casual breakfast for dinner, specifically Amu's ambitious Sunday morning spread. Enjoy day six. It is day six cooking out of start here, our final day. We are making Amu's ambitious Sunday morning spread. It includes two frizzled desi omelets with onion and chilies, hello fry. Flaky brown butter. Laka. Laka paratha. I'm sorry if I'm wrong. Citrus raita. We're skipping the radishes and cucumbers because we don't have any left. And the fruit custard. What do you think? Who needs radishes anyway? It's breakfast for dinner. Let's get cooking. Melt the butter over medium heat until foamy. Hers is slightly less dark than mine, but. Says mix with a wooden spoon. Oh, it's a shaggy mass. And let it sit for 15 minutes. A little bit flat. them over on top of each other. These are done. I'm just going to turn this whole thing into citrus right to Or at 
least an hour. Uh, where's the vanilla pod in here? How many egg yolks? Eight. <gasps> Fry, can you get off, please? Fry off. The tempering. Okay. I'm worried that this is too hot to just let it sit like this, but we'll do it. I don't like the idea of pressing plastic wrap to something that hot. I'm worried that's just gonna be one big thing of curdled goo. Okay, it's custardy. It's Raw ice cream. I'll get started prepping for the desi omelets. One Thai green chili. I don't know if we have green, but we definitely have red. I'm just gonna go red omelet. Uh, do you mind adding the pomegranates to the raita? You got it, ma'am. Tessa says, sizzles, great. Oh God, okay. Using a fish spatula, I have to try and flip this guy over. This is gonna be miserable, but we're gonna try it. Oh God! It looks like you did it. This was too so many grapes. We never wait for everyone to get a parata. Instead, each person digs in as soon as they get theirs. Beautiful omelet. I'm deplating it. Little dowel. This is my little tester. Quickly scrunch to release any steam. What are we supposed to do with it? Scrunch it. All right, I'm gonna burn my hands. What's the raita for? Probably to put on top of the omelet. Mm -hmm. She doesn't really say how to eat it. Here we go. We got the omelet. Obviously eggy, but the cilantro is great. I think you could do parsley, probably, if you don't like cilantro. Or you could probably go without it and it would be fine. But the onion is great with it. A little bit of crunch. And then that chili. Whoo, the that chili. chili. Is amazing. That chili is nice. Uh, did you try one of these? I had a, like the sample one, the test one. It's chewy. Mm. Flaky, so buttery, so light, chewy. Try with the raita. Wow. That pomegranate is great with it. A little burst of. Not even acid, but like. It's a little acidic, but just lightly. Yeah. The labna is like. Oh, it's um, labna. I was like, this texture. Yeah. It's like the thickest yogurt. It's like a cross between yogurt and sour cream, texturally. Tangy. And then you've got the citrus. But then those little bursts of like sweetness from the pomegranate. With the flaky, buttery prata, very tasty. Almost my favorite part. I do want to try the prata and custard because that's what she says. For dessert. To do, but I'm going to do it now. I'm doing it. Breakfast for dinner, dessert for starter. Mm -hmm. That custard is so sweet. It's um, very much in the vein of like a... I'm trying to think of what I can A bakery compare. French toast situation. Either way, it's pretty good. Coming through. Coming in hot. Oh, God. Oh, that's an uglier one. What do you think of it? I really like the omelet. I love the spiciness. I love like the intensity of flavor across like every ingredient. The paratha is good. It's, I mean, it's a flaky bread. It's really hard for a flaky bread to be bad. The raita is too sweet for me. And the custard has got to be too sweet for you then. Well, the custard feels more intentionally sweet. Whereas the raita, uh, raita I'm used to being the acid component. Mm. And that's what I keep wanting from it. But I just can't give it to me because it's so sweet. But. I am a savory breakfast boy. This is so just the sweet too stuff sweet. is not for you in general. The omelet's amazing though. Super on board with the omelet, super on board with the bread. I bet you would be into like that tomato sauce on top of the omelet. Holy shit. Brilliant idea. I'm gonna literally dip both of them in it right this second. Tomato garlic sauce. Uh-huh. As soon as it hit my tongue, I was like, yep, that's the one. Tell me that's not amazing. You just hand it back to me, eat it. Oh, you want me to eat the whole thing? Coward. That's pretty good. 
It's like that flavor that like makes you want more of it, you mm -hmm. know? Okay, what's the verdict here? I'm gonna say smash on the paratha, smash on the omelet, smash on the citrus raita. I really like this. The custard, I keep thinking this should be ice cream. If you dip the uh, paratha in it, it's also really good. It's a creme anglaise. I don't think it's a bad technique to know. Like, did you have to temper the eggs? Yes. Great. That's a good technique for people to learn. And I think the, the way that she structures the instructions for the raita is pretty interesting. Yeah, it's just like add this it's, stuff and taste it. And well, then if you don't like it, change it. Well, it's like, here's how to build contrast, which I think is really right. cool. The approach to me is better than the dish. How was the paratha to make? I've made something very similar, so I had no problems with it. The encouraging part for me, she stretched the paratha out as far as it could go, and it had holes in it, which is like, oh good, it doesn't have to be perfect. You can have holes in this dough. You're gonna roll it up anyway. Although it's a little bit steppy, uh, so you definitely need to make time for it, but I think it's worth it. And the best part is dough like this freezes really well, so we can hold on to our extra stuff and have like paratha ready. You also like don't need to be precious with your butter with these either. Mm. Like the butter doesn't have to be cold when you're spreading it around. Oh, nice. Yeah, you don't have to make brown butter ghee for this. You can just use ghee or ghee or butter or oil. Clarified I guess, butter, if you yeah. Have, yeah. So it can be very approachable. I feel like the omelet is less of a technique thing. It's like very straightforward. Yeah. But I think if you come from a background similar to ours, this would still be like a showstopper in a lot of ways. If you showed up to brunch with this thing, people are gonna be like, I think if you showed up to brunch with any of these things, people would be like, what the fuck? For me, if it's my brunch, the omelet and the tomato. All of this stuff makes me feel really good. The level of effort was appropriate, I think, for somebody who's like starting out. She has this marked as an advanced menu. Oh yeah, in this. Right. So after working with this book for six days, it's time for some scores. I can't talk about the accessibility of this book without also touching on some of the design choices. First and foremost, the sheer tonnage of this book allows for larger text size, which is great for somebody like me who's aging faster than she cares to admit. And the step-by-step -step photo guide that she has alongside the text makes for a really handy translation in case you get a little lost because words are hard sometimes. Oh, she says coarsely ground, but it looks like she got really fine. The only tool I didn't have on hand was a nonstick pot for that technique, but we made do. I was able to scrape off the majority of the bottom of this. And that makes me feel pretty good. <laughs> and the most difficult ingredient to track down was barberries, though it wasn't too hard to find them in LA. I think it's also helpful to note that there are 66 vegan and 149 gluten-free recipes in this book, all helpfully denoted by an easily glanceable tag. The only knock to the accessibility of this book is that it does require a lot of effort. So it makes you work for bread. And I think a lot of folks might struggle starting out but between her photo guides, some helpful breakdowns of what could have gone wrong, and some sciencey know-how. She's done a lot of work to cover a lot of bases. Accessibility is getting an eight. I already talked about the size of this book and the family meal style photo guides, but the labels of this book are another feature that I find extremely welcome. They make it easy to scan if a recipe is easy, intermediate, or advanced, and I found that she used bold text really thoughtfully to help you stay on track. It like keeps you moving, and I, appreciate that. The only downside to some of that bold text and larger font size is that occasionally it can push some of those photo guides to another page. Oh, here it is. It's on the next page. Didn't even see that. That's such a minor critique and this book is extremely well designed compared to some of the other books on the market today, so design is getting a nine. This book is equally divided into savory and pastry sections and each of those sections could be its own book. While in general, we liked a lot of Sola's savory dishes, there were a few misses. I've never chewed on a kitchen sponge, but stack them too high and you've got pizza. The actual cup is a little dry. Even while salted, we're getting nothing. And I think the biggest surprise for both of us was that we really enjoyed her desserts. Mm. Oh my God. It's so hard to stop eating. We sure. might eat this entire pavlova tonight. I'm very tempted. Having made a few of Sola's dessert recipes in the past, we had an expectation going into this week that these recipes would also be a little bit too sweet for us to stomach. There were definitely a few cases of that in Start Here, but even those gave us some fun ideas to keep in our back pocket. I think mm. I might just make the pudding part of it again, honestly. The aeration that I was doing at the end, I could have gone a little bit longer and we would have ended up with an even airier texture, mm. which would have been nice. Overall flavor gets a seven. The best part of the writing of this book is that every word feels like it's something that Sola would say. And so it feels like she's actually talking to you. 
The prose is light yet informative, and the overall tone is really encouraging. Now I want to make more of this. I'm not beating myself up about failing about this, because one, it tastes amazing still. And two, I think I know where I fucked up and how to change it for the next time. She doesn't expect you to nail everything on the first try, and that's okay. The only frustrations we ran into are in some of the measurements. Two tablespoons plus one teaspoon. Two 13.5 ounce cans of full fat coconut milk. And then you have to take 120 grams of those two cans and put it in this other thing. And then she's like, now combine the rest of your coconut milk into this other thing. And I'm like, oh, fuck. You need 645 grams for the other stuff. Thank you. And occasionally her written directions and photo descriptions didn't completely match up instead. Okay, so hers is finer than what hers you've is got fine. here. Yeah. Because this is not emulsified. We've got like long strings. Right, but she also says grated, coarsely grated Parmesan. I think my advice would be if she tries to describe a texture, double check her photos for reference. Writing is getting an eight. Y'all told us that three smashes was not enough to justify the cost of a book, so we're bumping that requirement up to 50% smash rate. In the case of Start Here, we got 16 smashes out of the 23 recipes made, easily clearing that bar with a 70% smash rate. We may not have enjoyed the short ribs or the kofta as much as we wanted to, but the desserts really took us by surprise. I think the thing that I'm the most excited about from this book are the desserts in it, honestly. The pavlova, the pudding pie, the mahalabia. All great desserts that I don't think I ever would have tried to make myself if I hadn't cooked out of this book. That puts value at a solid 9 and sets our initial cult score for Start Here at 8.2. But I think the real question is, should someone who's never cooked before start here? For me, the answer is maybe. I think as a first time cook, you would basically have to cook everything in this book sequentially and probably have to make a lot of the recipes multiple times to really understand what's happening in the recipes. And just know that you're probably not gonna get it perfect on the first try, mm -hmm. which is how you end up with this, but it still tastes good. And while Start Here is fairly exhaustive, there are definitely some cases where a new cook will run into issues. You have to make sure that your milk isn't gonna scorch to the bottom of your pan. You can't just walk away from it while it's heating up. That's pretty easy though. But she doesn't mention that at all. Oh, interesting. So it's like, it's little stuff like that that's just like, oh, you have to have some understanding of like what could happen if you walk away from this thing. But I also think that's just the nature of a physical book. You can't include everything. That being said, I think if you're an elementary level cook right now, but you're looking for like a college level cooking 101 course so you can up your game and cook with the big dogs, then I think Start Here might be an excellent book to add to your shelf. Hello, good boy.